So this is this is is a shock on shock calicavera. This is the it's the house of the witch or the hag or the goddess, the sovereignty goddess, whatever interpretation you're taking. Uh, it's of the passage tomb tradition, uh, not been excavated, so we haven't any artifacts from it. Uh, and it's one of four uh, monuments, reasonable, much of this scale. Um, I think as you uh, as you walked up, you might have got a glimpse. You can, you can just about see the other cairn over there on the on the peak of the hill. Um, that's uh, Schlieve Dargan. And there's another one further over from that, which is the biggest of the series. Again, uh, not, uh, not excavated. Schlieve Gaye, the mountain of two birds or auspicious birds, depending on which translation of Middle Irish you favour. And then beyond that, there's Achamor Far, another word, a mixed in, mixture of English uh, and, um, and, and Irish in the Ordnance Survey. So, summit of Nocturne, we're coming up on the summit. And of course, this is kind of an absolutely massive cairn, but there's so much more to the story than the cairn, you know. I was trying to shout through the rain down below about the banks and, and the, the, that extraordinary complex system of banks. What I didn't say down below is that they were filled with artifacts of church, the black church that occurs in the limestone, in the sedimentary limestone. That church was most likely quarried down uh, in Raskarik, down where we were, the, the, the first place we, were, we went to, on that ridge. Because we discovered a few years ago, it's probably the largest church, prehistoric church quarry in Ireland, on that ridge. Uh, so just at the foot of Nocturne. And the church, we had about 6,000 pieces of church recorded in that quarry. But they are all just chunks. And a few, you only have a few artifacts. But most likely they brought the good pieces up to the banks halfway up the hill, where they actually use the church and to produce different kind of artifacts, and mainly these little lovely kind of concave scrapers. It's a small church scraper in stone with a concave edge. Don't ask me what they were used for, that's another story. We don't know, to be honest. Obviously, you can see the peninsula stretching out amazingly in front of us. Um, uh, the Balisadair Bay must have been an extraordinary estuary. You know, the, all the readings about the, its riches in oysters. It's, it's, uh, over on the left, there's that Tanrego intake. And Tanrego intake in, was, is, is, a, is a post-industrial landscape. Because in the middle of the 18th century, there was a huge rampart built there. It's one of the other big stone monuments that we have in the Sligo landscape. Millions of tons of earth built by British Army sappers, uh, uh, possibly to block against the tsunami. There's some suggestion in the uh, 1837 um, uh, folklore accounts of, of the water rushing up and covering the, or co crossing the Kulira Peninsula might have been the Lisbon tsunami. There was two tsunamis in the middle of the 18th century. But another consequence of that big rampart over there was that you blocked off one of the most amazing beaches. It must have been the descriptions of it are, are astonishing uh, at Tanrego. And there there was a cairn, which was said to be by Petrie and others, to be one of the wonders of the world. Drawn by Gabriel Beranger in 1779, but gone now, it was taken away. So we have lost things, uh, of course, over the course of time. It's horrible. You can't ever get that history back. Once it's been destroyed, um, there's just no way to get back to it. So I think it's, it's a shame for thousands of years that it has been preserved for the most part and then just a couple of seconds of somebody trying to, you know, get rich or get glory that, or just be irresponsible, that they destroy that and it's it's really horrific and it's not a good, you know, ambassador for Ireland to, to have that. We need to protect our monuments like happens all over the world. There are, to your right, there are two smaller sites. You can just make out the first one. It's a low kind of embankment, but it's probably the base, maybe of a passage tombs that never was or a passage tomb that has, might have been <coughs> demolished, or they used the material somewhere else. And the, beyond that, there's a, smaller, there's a smaller cairn with a lovely cruciform chamber about 100 meters from where we are. So you have two passage tombs on that side. And on the south side of the cairn, which we won't go because we will be hammered by the wind, but we see those when we go back. There are in all six small sites, very discreet, low sites. And three of them are megalithic, so they consist of a, a megalithic chamber and part of a boulder circle, like the one in the forest we saw earlier this, this afternoon, but on an even smaller scale. And those smaller sites, they most likely predate this cairn behind me. 
So they probably were using the site with the summit at a very early stage and first later on erected this huge cairn. Linked to that, the smaller site is also, yes, in front of you, you're not looking at it, but to my left, you can see a small a flat slab just behind Michael. It's just lies flat on, this, on, this, on the sky down here, about 50 meters from me. That's a large limestone slab, about two by two meters and that thick. It lies flat on the ground. Due south of the cairn, and you'll see that when we walk around the cairn, you have a massive granite, or a nice, or boldly nice, a massive erratic, this size, that high, um, of nice. And those two, the slab and the boulder, are the only large stones, literally, outside the cairn. So they, and they are aligned more or less exactly north-south. Also, some of the smaller sites on, on south of the cairn are located on that alignment. So, my guess would be that this slab and the large boulder predates the cairn as well. So you do have an alignment, you do have a, a structure, a layout of the summit before the massive cairn was built. Date-wise, we just don't know, but I would guess the mid or the early part of the fourth millennium BC for these smaller sites. So the mountain was probably taken into, in, in, or brought into the rituals and society much, much long before the large cairn was built. I'm disgusted that, uh, that, that they could cause that sort of damage in broad daylight, probably, and that no one collared them, these people, for doing that such damage. That's, that's what I'm, I'm disappointed with. A large heap of stones. Uh, there are about five or six stones that is the part of the original curb that is now and then visible. There's only one visible today, and that's on the far side. We can stop by that when we walk around, because it's really worth seeing. And when you see that curb, or that uh, lovely slab, you will see, say, who needs art? Because it's a beautifully meandered, uh, nice uh, boulder, or bouldery nice. Uh, so it's a beautiful piece. And again, coming back to this fact that the, the curb, or the circle of stones, is never in limestone. So the few curbs that we have in this is, of course, from erratics or from, from igneous rocks uh, and not on limestone. The, the cairn has never been excavated. Someone asked me before when we walked up if they, if they ever will. I hope it won't. Uh, we kind of know what's in there. Um, either it's absolutely nothing, it's just a big heap of stones. It might be, because we do have those kind of cairns as well. But it also be some, it could be something along the lines of new grains. It could be very uh, elaborate and a very complex chamber and passage. We just don't know. But I don't think we, that wouldn't be the most kind of first protocol if you would like to understand the hill more uh, than we do today. There are other aspects of the hill that I think is important that you could spend your research, energy and money on than, ex than attacking something like this. Absolutely not, and I, I was devastated with that. You know, I, I just can't believe it, um, that somebody would do that and make that effort to go up to damage, you know, so I think it's so important that we have the education out there, you know, and that uh, make people aware that this can happen. I, I, I wouldn't even have thought that people would be going up on top of the hills to do that, you know, because it's just terrible, it's, it's hard to believe, hard to believe, yeah. Um, and these monuments, this one, as someone said there on Twitter lately, with the uh, fl flourish of activity over the last few days, you know, it's such a remote place and it's so kind of out of the way. But uh, what a beautiful monument. You can, you can have a look inside it. Uh, it's got a, a chamber, it's a very complex chamber, maybe the more t Stefan's de uh, department than mine, but just to temper these kind of um, these speculations that I sometimes enter into about alignment and orientation, just to say this one, this one points nowhere where the sun or moon rises. It points to the, um, to the southwest. Um, and so therefore we have to, when we think about the motivation of alignment and everything else, you have to think about other possibilities of pointing towards other monuments, of pointing towards places or things of which we cannot now uh, decipher. We do have though, and that has been a kind of a very uh, uh, problematic issue with, with the cairn up here, is that you might have spotted, and you have one under your foot, piece of quartz. And uh, they... The more people that come, the more wear and tear you have on the ground. And people start actually to dig for these quartz stones. And Porik mentioned it this morning. 
um, and it's appalling behavior because you haven't a clue how big that is. And when people start to dig, they might come up with a big boulder and they actually cart it down and probably sell it off. I don't know what to do with it. And it's really an issue when it comes to conservation, how you deal with that. And of course, people think Newgrange. Because quartz is such an integral part of the passage tomb story and the, the link to the rituals of, of, of the passage tomb people. And quartz was used in different ways, not necessarily as O'Kelly thought, as a facade for Newgrange, but in stone settings and different kind of arrangements along these large cairns. What I'd say is there's, there's three things that come to mind for me about the sites. The first is they're extraordinary places. Anytime we bring people into this landscape, they're blown away and they just have a thirst for more. And they, you know, these are people that have traveled the world, people from you know, all countries on, on this tour today, um, and they haven't seen anything like it. So it's an incredible place. It's also a fragile landscape. So as we go from monument to monument, you can see different kinds of damage that's been done. Uh, natural damage, humanly made damage, sometimes vandalism as we've seen earlier today. So that leads naturally to the third thing is that these sites need to be protected. How do we protect them? Uh, and we think a World Heritage Site designation and just raising awareness in people's consciousness of how special these places they are. They want them not just for future generations but for this generation. Um, and you know to bring their kids and so on to these sites so uh, it's a wonderful resource it's a resource we don't even know the potential of yet in the future the things we're still learning about these sites um, so anything we can do to to keep them here for today and tomorrow is our objective <laughs>